Hi everyone, this is lecture 10.1 where we are talking about urban and rural problems. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about the brief history of urbanization, problems with urban life, problems with rural life, and then ways we can improve both urban and rural life. Uh, in terms of content warnings, we're talking about poverty, food insecurity, and domestic violence. So let's briefly look at this phenomena of urbanization, which really goes hand in hand with modern human living, whether you live in an urban area or not. So for the bulk of human history, cities simply did not exist. It's only been for the last 300 years, not 300, 3000 years, that we have lived in anything that you could even call a city in any way. And it's only since the last, late 1800s that city became in any way appealing to the non-elite. You had to be intensely wealthy to live in a city in any kind of comfortable way prior to 1800. And it wasn't until the year 2007 that more than 50% of humans started living in urban areas, which is like so, I mean, in terms of human history, 2007 was like an hour ago. Thus, there are many types of cities and the academic definition of city is very, very broad. An urban area in this sense is defined as a territory with a population of at least 2,500 people. And I grew up in a really small town in Western Pennsylvania. Our population was twice that. And I would by no means outside of an academic context call that an urban area. But um, in the general sense, yeah, that, that, that is an urban area. It just means a denser population of human beings. Um, these urban areas in the broad sense are distinguished from what we call megacities. A megacity is defined as a population of over 10 million people. And that is truly a massive city. Uh, so for example, the population of Columbia, South Carolina is 137,000 people. The population of Charleston is 150,000 people. These would be cities that are uh, 100 times bigger than those two cities. So the largest city uh, as of 2016 in the world was Tokyo. Uh, the next, uh, the largest American city on this list is New York City, which is about half of the population of Tokyo. So if you've ever been to New York City, it's, it's almost incomprehensible if you haven't been to New York City that huge of a place with that many people, it almost becomes like its own living, breathing hive of humanity. Um, it's, it's a really interesting thing to a sociologist. So in my head, to even imagine something twice as big as New York City is really hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, on this list, yeah, they're Los Angeles is the only other American city on this list of mega cities, which really, it, it kind of puts uh, the United States into perspective compared to other places as well. So the mass movement of people from rural areas to urban areas caught the attention of sociologists very early in the life of the discipline. It's important to remember that sociology only really became its own thing in the late 1800s. And during that time, there were a lot of people moving from the country into the city. But the question, and the question they asked is, why are people doing this? Why are cities suddenly appealing to people? Well, uh, until the late 1700s, there was no modern sewage and cities were absolutely ridden with disease. So they got that fixed kind of at the end of the 1700s and over the course of the 1800s, 
basically cities became livable if you weren't willing to like literally live with with poo and mess everywhere after the advent of sewage then disease and filth reduced right it got livable now by our modern standpoint we would still think it was super gross but by their standpoint they said okay we can work with this additionally then the primary driver to cities was that factories were providing new opportunities for people now it must be said that factory work during that era was wildly brutal and wildly dangerous and completely unacceptable in the modern sense but even those jobs given their level of danger and their level of hardness was easier than subsistence farming which was what most people were doing uh it really those of us who have never if you've never really been around farming if you've never really uh seen that firsthand uh farmers are some of the toughest grittiest people you would ever meet it, it's a very 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 hard work so prior to, to industrialization people often worked in the farm and the farm was the home right and that changed lives in a major way so economic production was the duty of the family you worked with your family all women in that sense worked all children in that sense worked and basically the family was the working unit after industrialization and when those factories sprung up and people moved, families moved to the city well men were the only ones working in those factories and the rest of the family was dependent on the men those men would work up to 14 hours a day up to seven days a week remember in the lect lecture on unions we talked about how unions came to change a lot of that and a lot of the reason why the unions took off in the late 1800s is because people were so fed up with those working conditions and it should be pointed out then that se think that seven days a week looks wild to us today but it's important to remember the concept of the weekend is a modern social construct it is a modern idea thus women were then given the job of keeping the apartment clean and keeping and caring for little children little children but older children say like eight nine ten as old as my older daughter is they were expected to then go work in the factory because especially boys because there were no child labor laws i just look at this little boy's feet in the lower picture he's not even wearing shoes at that loom it would be so easy for one of his toes to get lopped off like so utterly easy and that sort of thing did happen very very frequently so that first generation of German sociologists gave us a number of, a number of key concepts for understanding uh, human behavior in cities. Uh, these ideas were Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft is the idea that traditional societies in which family and community ties are very strong. And in those societies, people cared for each other and looked out for each other this is similar to what uh, Emil Durkheim uh, talked about later on uh, among so uh, in his sociological work and I'll actually get on that in the next slide and then there was the idea of Gesellschaft the weakening of social ties and personal relationships as society grows and becomes more industrialized so these original sociologists observed that family units were tighter that society was stronger in terms of family bonds the way it used to be but couldn't quite put it together why that bond is weaker 
in what they would then call the modern sense. That time is now historic for us, but the phenomena holds up. But, but how does it work? Well, Emil Durkheim showed us that. Uh, Durkheim observed that one of the major ways that separate urban populations from rural populations is how individuals relate to each other. In a rural population, they are more prone to what's called mechanical solidarity. And that's easy to get mixed up because we're talking about factories. Um, mechanical solidarity is the stuff that happens in the countryside, in farming societies. That, that um, difficulty between these two terms is actually due to kind of um, the nuances of the French language. So just, just remember mechanical solidarities for the countryside. In societies with mechanical solidarity, the social bonds and community feelings um, were there because everyone was basically the same kind of person. Populations were intensely homogenous. What does that mean? They were all the same race, they were all the same class, all the same profession, all the same religion, everyone all basically lived all the same lives. And if you know in your town, everyone's the same as you, everyone believes the same as you, whatever, it's really easy to get along with everyone else. However, as we became more urban, society shifted to organic solidarity. And in this situation, the social ties that exist are, are uh, coming from the division of labor. So thus, everyone gets along because we need each other to get along. So I need someone to fix my car, so I'm nice to the mechanic. Um, people need me, hypothetically, to teach college, so that's why they're nice to me, um, etc. Right? We are nice to each other because we need each other to keep going, but obviously that idea is a little bit harder and that type of society then is a little bit weaker than that easier form of solidarity that we find from everyone just being all the same as in mechanical solidarity. That last point I made just restates that mechanical solidarity tends to be stronger and easier to achieve than organic solidarity. Political economy then is the interaction of political and economic institutions and processes involving those institutions. In capitalist societies, institutions and individuals do tend to act in their own self-interests. And that's absolutely an observation that Karl Marx specifically made. This phenomena then operates on meso and macro levels. You don't usually find um, phenomena surrounding political economy on the micro level of analysis. So for example, you may have a hospital that wants to expand their facility. The hospital's doing well, but it might be located in a poor community. And in that poor community, there is a rundown housing project directly beside the hospital. Because the hospital is more powerful and the people living in the housing project are not powerful, the hospital is able to tear down the housing projects so that it may expand and the people who live in those projects are forced to move because as a whole they are less powerful than the hospital. That is an example of political economy. Though that group that is the most powerful is able to take control of situations in a more economic sense. It's a it sounds like a big idea, but it's actually kind of a relatively simple idea. So now let's move to problems in urban life and talking about some of them. So Rodney Stark, uh, who's a sociologist, observed that areas with severe population density, and he, uh, he really was talking about crowding in terms of population density, tend to result from high crime rates regardless of who is actually living in that place. And he called those places with high population density, he called them deviant places because of their capacity to kind of encourage deviance. 
So from the standpoint, it is not because somebody is poor or because they're black or Mexican or whoever they are. It's not because of the people that live in the place. It's the conditions under which people live that causes them to be more deviant. And this matches with other criminological pr principles as well. Um, a basic uh, principle of criminology is that the, the more interactions people have with other human beings, um, the more likelihood that each of each individual action, each individual interaction with another person has a very, 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 very small chance of becoming a criminal interaction, right? Thus, the more people you interact with, the more people everyone interacts with, the more crime will actually happen. We see the same thing surrounding crime rates in the summer and the winter. Crime rates tend to drop in the winter because fewer people interact with each other and they rise in the summer because that's when more people are interacting with each other. Thus, deviant places are more prone to problems in this regard. Uh, so by definition, uh, crowding, that is part of deviant places. And also uh, crime by definition happens more in deviant places, but also housing is different in deviant places. If many people want to or are forced to live in one location, there will be problems with putting all of those places, people in a reasonable living space. Thus, some people will be forced to live in unreasonable living spaces. And those people forced into unreasonable living spaces will be more prone to crime in order to survive and also those people living in okay living spaces will be afraid to lose those living spaces and that may also make them susceptible to committing crime. Additionally, there is some evidence that mental health problems could be linked to this type of dense, dense population. That, that um, data isn't overwhelming. It's not a super clear relationship but there's some data there. It's not like a scientific principle, but it's absolutely something that is of concern. And then homelessness. Homelessness obviously has a lot to do with housing. Um, a combination of then housing problems and mental health problems contributes to homelessness. Thus, if people are mentally unstable, they may be unable to stay housed. And we see kind of these vicious cycles occurring among homeless people. Additionally, in urban areas, there are traffic and transportation issues. If many people live in one location, it is harder to move everybody who wants to be moved. So there will be too much traffic because everyone's trying to move someplace all at once. There won't be enough room on subway cars. There won't be enough physical space on roads for cars, etc. Additionally, urban areas have higher degrees of air pollution. This is caused not only by factories, but also by power plants, by cars, by people cooking over fires in those places that that's what people need to survive. And additionally, uh, public education can be a problem in, our, in urban areas. Often public education is better in urban areas, but if, and this is a kind of a United States problem. If the neighborhood that a school is in has low property values, then the funding for that school will be poor, right? If it's in high property values, you'll, kids will get a good education. It's not really that the American education system doesn't work. It's that the American education system doesn't work for everybody. Many kids go to very good schools in the United States, but um, many children who are not privileged don't get that really great education. So uh, we're going to look at problems in rural areas next, but there are some problems that both urban and rural areas share. Uh, housing is one example. They're simply, even though there are a lot of houses, and a lot of those houses are even empty, 
there is not enough affordable housing in the United States. And there are additionally fewer inspectors and craftspeople make it harder to fix problems and fix the homes that actually exist. So, so basically there aren't enough skilled people to give people the houses that they need. Um, additionally, in terms of homelessness, Homelessness also does exist in rural areas, but in rural areas, it's often ignored. In very rural areas, some homeless people may just live in the woods. Uh, this is a little bit of anecdotal evidence, but in my hometown, there were n people known to live in the woods, and that is a form of homelessness. Uh, homeless people in the city, they live in the streets, and yeah, that I got ahead of myself in speaking, and that's that's totally real. It's not just Bigfoot that lives in the woods. Additionally, there are transportation issues also in the country. So in the country, there are no buses, no taxis, no trains, no food delivery, no Ubers. If you don't have a car, you have to walk. Um, the public education problem being tied to property values is the same in rural areas as urban areas. So a poor country school can be just as bad at educating as a poor inner city school. There isn't really any kind of superiority there. One's just as bad as the other. And in terms of crime, there may be less crime in small, it's really hard to gauge really. There may be less crime in small towns or it may be that since there aren't enough police, that crime is just kind of ignored. Um, again, talking about my small hometown, we just kind of ignored crime. It happened, but we didn't pay attention to it. So let's now specifically talk about rural life. As mentioned previously, uh, sociologists do have a very distinct tendency to focus on urban areas. Uh, however, there is an entire subdiscipline of sociology that studies non-urban areas. Uh, this is called rural sociology. So if you want to read more up on that, you can uh, use your uh, journal search engine through the library to find journals on rural sociology. And uh, what isn't covered by rural sociologists is typically picked up by our colleagues in anthropology. Uh, so the mainstream of sociology really kind of focuses a lot of energy on urban areas, but rural sociologists tend to focus on those rural areas, and then uh, anything else is covered pretty well by anthropologists. So what problems do rural areas have that urban areas don't? Well, in terms of physical health problems, there are fewer hospitals and fewer healthcare providers in rural areas. This can cause some rural people to see themselves as highly self-reliant. We take care of ourselves. You don't need to go to a hospital for that. Or sometimes think of uh, maybe ineffective remedies as being effective. That is a pretty common human behavior when you don't have a way to treat something, you kind of make up your own cure for something, even if it's not actually effective. Um, there's a lot of really great stuff to be found in folk me medicine, but a lot of folk medicine also is not necessarily backed up by any kind of science. So that becomes a problem to a degree. Additionally, greater physical distances can make emergencies much more serious. So this can cause a delay in care of many maladies and may even result in disability or death to the individual because of the delay to getting to an emergency room. Additionally, uh, in terms of mental health problems, there are far fewer mental health facilities than other healthcare facilities in the United States as a whole. That means that there are very, very few mental health facilities in the United States and mental health problems tend to be even more stigmatized in rural areas 
due to a lower uh, tendency and a lower highly educated population. The less educated a population is, the more they tend to stigmatize mental health issues. Um, so that, that really, again, becomes another vicious feedback cycle. Like poor rural areas, I, I talked about this a little bit, but I'll go over this again just to make sure I don't uh, miss anything. Um, so poor uh, country schools are just as bad as poor city schools, but rural areas also experience this phenomenon known as brain drain. This is defined as the tendency of young people who leave their hometowns to seek education and not return after they get that education. So kids leave small towns, they go to colleges, and they don't go back to the small towns. That's exactly what I did. This is possibly because there are no jobs that require their education. And that also applies to my situation. I can't, I can't be a sociology professor living 100 miles outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There just aren't any jobs for that. Additionally, because of the perspectives of that now educated young person, they um, have shifted and no longer match those of the small town that may suffer from anti-intellectualism. So effectively what happens is the kids come back from college and they think in a way that is different from the town that may be suffering from what's known as culture of poverty. And thus the worldviews of the educated don't necessarily match with that of the undereducated and thus conflict can arise and more often than not, that causes the more educated person to simply leave as opposed to fighting with the culture of the town that is there. Um, sometimes it goes the other way, but this is the most common trend, right? Um, it, it, and it's, it's deeply unfortunate, uh, but it, it is totally very real. People with lower levels of education are more level likely to experience poverty. And that kind of almost inherently makes sense. Additionally, in rural areas, there are fewer social services. There is less access to food banks. If people could go, are going hungry, there's less ways to get the food they need. There is less heating and cooling assistance. So in the South, there are problems with people overheating in the summer. In the North, there are problems with people freezing in the winter. And there are fewer public recreation opportunities as well in rural areas. There aren't really many um, public community centers or libraries or other types of facilities. And if they are there, they may be poorly funded. That is definitely more of a rural problem because the budgets simply aren't as large as they are in metropolitan areas. Additionally, it can be harder to access really important resources such as uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles. It's, it's a lot harder to go to the DMV if you live in a really small rural area as opposed to in an urban area. Uh, so for my house, I can drive to about four different DMVs in less than 10 minutes, right? So for example, grocery stores are often half an hour away or an hour away. That is a big problem, especially if you don't have a car, which some people don't. And uh, important records such as death certificates, birth certificates, marriage certificates, those are often quite difficult to access in rural areas, especially in the era prior to the internet. But even in our modern era, it can be difficult uh, to access those things. Okay. So in terms of risk factors of domestic violence, uh, domestic violence is uh, somewhat more common in rural areas 
namely because of th these three um, big risk factors. These are these are things of great concern if you are thinking about, hey, are these people at risk of domestic violence? First off is poverty. The stress of financial trouble is a major trigger in many domestic violence situations. And that's true in both urban and rural areas. However, the, um, well, I'll get to that in the last point. In the poverty point, the problem there is if, if a family doesn't have money, then that's something that arguments can spring out of. And then in a toxic environment, that can get bad. Second of all, being married young, people who are married under the age of 25 are much more likely to be in domestic violence situations. This is uh, thought to be because of the relative life inexperience of the individual. And age at first marriage is actually is much lower in rural areas as opposed to urban areas, thus making people in rural settings more prone in this factor. And then finally, the major difference between urban areas and rural areas in terms of domestic violence is in terms of social isolation. Social isolation has a major impact on mental health and can have a major impact on relationships. There is nobody observing the couple, except maybe children, to say, this interaction is wrong. You can't treat the other person like that, or you two can't treat each other in that way, or can't you see this is crazy? A, an outside observer in many troubled situations can really pull back and keep something from getting out of control, right? Uh, there are fewer observers in isolated areas, additionally, in the event of a physically violent event. So abusers can get away with what they do if the couple is isolated and there's less chance of injuries from uh, less chance of those injuries from violence being reported. So uh, if domestic violence goes unnoticed and unreported, obviously, then no one can help the person who is being ab abused. And that is really the, the major troubling factor of rural domestic violence. So let's look at a few ways that both urban and rural life can be improved. Well, I don't know why that's bolded, that's a typo. While specific situations to problems relating to urban and rural problems uh, are similar to both uh, uh, urban and rural areas, that is because they are tied to poverty. So in terms of education, we can provide opportunities and programs that appeal to people in the given community. So you go from community to community and see what kind of educational programs they may want. And that would really help the individual location. Additionally, can provide continuing education, and that includes skill building and craftsmanship building education to help people address problems in their local communities. There aren't enough plumbers, let's train some more plumbers. There aren't enough doctors, let's train some more doctors. Gear the education to the needs of the actual community. Food deserts are another issue that are present both in urban areas and rural areas. A food desert is defined as an area in which there is not enough healthy food. In an urban area, this takes the place of convenience stores. It's an area where uh, maybe a couple mile area where there's no fresh grocery store, all the food has to be bought from convenience stores. So if you're somebody that doesn't have reliable transportation, the only food you have is basically the junk food from the convenience store. That is not going to be the nutrition you need to live a healthy life. In rural areas, these stores tend to be places like dollar stores, not quite like convenience stores. And uh, my hometown, especially in many rural areas, uh, the only place to actually buy groceries is at the dollar store. And you can get enough food to eat for the week at the dollar store, but you're not gonna be able to buy any sort of fresh vegetables or fresh meat or anything like that. It's all gonna be frozen and it's all gonna be relatively high in calories and preservatives and all that stuff that we know isn't really good for us. 
In both urban and rural areas, we can improve transportation. So in urban areas, we can subsidize transportation. In poor areas, we can fix bus stations or train stations to uh, be uh, more functional. We can reduce fares to those services for poor people and allow, maybe allow them to use public transportation for free, right? You make less than this given income, so therefore you can ride the bus for free. Um, that's one option. In rural areas, we can try to help by extending train lines out of cities so that they can help serve the countryside at least a little bit. We can also do that by extending bus routes. So that would at least help areas a little bit outside of the city. Additionally, we can grow rideshare services, things like your Uber and Lyft and that sort of thing, so that those without transportation can get some transportation when they absolutely need to, so that rural people aren't forced to walk along the highway, which absolutely happens. Additionally, uh, we uh, can improve resources in terms of opening additional social service agencies in poor areas rather than um, having them in other towns or other parts of towns. We need to locate them in places where people need the services. And this could have an additional added effect of increasing employment because we'll need somebody to run those services, so thus building the community. Every employment opportunity or almost every employment opportunity is yet another way to grow a community and help it grow and help it thrive. Okay, that is the end of this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions on it, just feel free to ask.